Final word, Jeff Lemon, Adam Collins, Royal Challengers, Bangalore. They've finally done it. They've finally won themselves a title in the Indian domestic T20 competition. Uh, it was the WPL, so it's the women who got there first, uh, which is quite funny in its own way after um, the, the sort of uh, star-crossed version of the men's uh, Royal Challengers team over the years, despite all the great players it's had and great performances it's had. Um, the women in their second season have come in and said, OK, that's how you win a championship. Um, did it in style, uh, rolled through the end of the group stage, rolled through the finals and had a fair bit of fun doing it. It was underlined by that. That um, I mean, you can't get much of a better viral uh, socials moment than Elise Perry putting the ball through the window of a sponsor's car that was parked at the side of the field and then being presented with the broken <laughs> window at the end of the tournament as a souvenir um, in a frame, which was a nice touch, but um, Elise Perry smashed everything else, including all of her opponents, um, you know, absolute red-hot streak and, and showed the value of all of those years of experience and calm and composure, batting, bowling, the lot. Yeah, so um, you're right. The Galacticos of uh, RCB, the men have never won anything, and the women they had to do it the hard way, right? Like they were, they needed to win their last couple of group stage games, and one of them was against Mumbai, who'd already qualified for the finals, and this was the key game for them, and they rolled them for 113. But that belies the the power play that Mumbai had. They were none for 43. Mm. Then Perry comes on, and you know, just when you think at least Perry's career is going in one direction, it kind of pulls back in the other. I remember in I don't know 2018 when she wasn't getting a Guernsey in the in the Australian T20 side anymore. She was thought to be batting too slow. Then she completely changed much. her game. All well, the same applies with, with with bowling here, right? Hadn't bowled, hadn't taken a wicket in the whole tournament. And then in the space of two and a half overs, take six for 15. It's an astonishing um, performance to mm-hmm. drag her side into the finals. Um, four bowled, two leg before. Got the incision. And then next ball, bowls a beautiful slow ball that Harman Preet chops on. On a hat trick, and Harman Preet's had a massive season for Mumbai. She's been dominant to that point. Again, rem- reminder, the season is on the line for RCB when Perry's bowling this spell. Um, and then gets Mealy Kerr, leg before wicket when charging. A very modern review where Kerr was way down the track, but Perry's like, no, no, I think mm. that's hit in line. And they sent it upstairs, and her suspicion was confirmed. Um, then she bowls an off cutter that jags like an off break to take off stump out of the ground. Yeah. Does a similar thing to Vastrika, uh, who tried to hit her from Delhi to Durham Sharla, but um, didn't make contact. That was her fifth wicket. And by the time she had Nat Sivabrunt, her second leg before, which was the final ball of Perry's spell, it was seven for 82 and effectively game over. And sure enough, she walked out and strums 40 not out. Uh, and they win inside 15 overs and, and get themselves mm-hmm. into the final. And the, the, the eliminator they were scheduled to play was also against Mumbai. Reminded me of like, and this will, some people will remember this, in 1990, last game of the regular season, Hawthorne played Melbourne. It was Michael Tuck's 404th game. I remember that. It was the game where he overtook KB. Um, and Hawthorne get done by a couple of goals. Then they had to play, and they were a better side than Melbourne for most of the year, but had to get them the next week as well in the elimination final. And Melbourne had just beaten Hawthorne. And like, you know, if you've just beaten a side and you get them in the finals the next week, you're in, you're in pretty good nick. And I'm not sure who Michael Tuck is in this analogy, but RCB <laughs> getting Mumbai again. <laughs> In the next game. Probably is Perry um, because she's played forever. I mean, she's played Perry. for about as about as long <laughs> as Michael Tuck did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's probably played 426 times uh, for her country. That's how many games that Tucky played for Hawthorne. He did play 100 reserves games as well. Um, but RCB batted first well, this she's time. Played and made 300, hasn't she? And six. She's, she's played a hell of a lot of, yeah. hell of, a lot of starts uh, for the green and gold. Yep. Someone let us know who's played more games, Elise Perry or Michael Tuck. Uh, no, she Perry went, she went past three hundred recently. She went past. She's like, yeah, she's like a hundred and fifty odd in both of the white ball formats plus whatever she's played in tests, which is a dozen or so. So she's got to be at like three ten or something like that. Maybe she'll catch him. Yeah, maybe she will. That's her incentive. All right, Elise, keep playing until you overtake Tucky's four twenty six. Um, she made sixty six from fifty <laughs> balls. Uh, in the semi. Uh, you know, you can see all the players with this experience, right? So Matthews and Sibber Brunt both take two for 18 from four overs. Perry's down the other end, holding on, wickets falling, but gets them to the competitive total, what proves to be very competitive, 135 for six, the lowest scoring game. And Mumbai absolutely botched the end of their chase. They needed 16 to win with seven wickets in hand, with 13 balls to go. 
and that's the delivery where Harman Preet hold out to Long on. She was out for 33 from 30. Mm. It left two overs for 16 runs. Uh, Molyneux bowled over number 19, was unhittable. Asha Sabana bowled over number 20. Um, and Mealy Kerr and Pooja Vastrika couldn't get the job done and they um, restricted them to 130. So the RCB um, win both the final group game and the semi-final. This one was by five runs. Um, Perry chipped in with the ball as well. She had Yastika Bhatika um, out uh, for 19 earlier on. So player of the match in both of those games, Elise Perry. They go into the final against Delhi, Jeff and uh, you know, the RCB had been beaten by Delhi in the group stage by 25 runs, but they're on a roll now. And, you know, once you're in a roll in a, in a, in a situation like this, it, it can go a certain way. But it's a little bit deceptive again. So they bowl out Delhi for 113 in just 18.3 overs. But Delhi at none for 64 at one stage, not long after the power play. Then Molyneux comes on and takes three wickets in one over. Shafali Verma, mm-hmm. 44 from 27, always the danger. Then gets Jamima Rodriguez and Alice Capshi, both for Ducks in consecutive deliveries. And that opened the door to the 21-year-old Offi Sriyanka Patel. She played a, a couple of one days after last year's WPL and kind of got herself in the frame for selection and um, picked up four for 12 in the final. Had Lanning leg before wicket for 23. Went mm. through the tail later on. There was another sort of relatively close chase in that... It went to the 20th over, but they had Perry there who made 35 from 37. She was never going to let things get out of control. Risha Gosh made 17 not out, a boundary to win the match with three balls to spare. Uh, and as you said before, um, it is the RCB's first title, a long time coming. It's, yeah, I mean, the, these kind of games as well, that there was that, there was that thinking with Perry, like you said, when everything's in games where everything's about power hitting and you've got teams making 190 and trying to chase that, then you can make the argument that Perry's a bit slow on batting strike rate, you know, even now. But for all of those other games where that's not the case, you know, and given that, that you're particularly in the WPL where you're likely to be playing on some slower pitches. Um, there's going to be a little bit more purchase. Um, scores aren't going to be as big. That sort of player is just so valuable um, with with that batting now, with that calm to be able to manage a, a 120 to a 140 chase. You're probably going to be uh, needing mm. that more often than you're going to need a 190 chase, I suppose, in, this, um, in, in, in the way that this tournament is structured. So in that sense, you know, she's still basically the most valuable player going around and and proved that. Um, the Australian women are heading off to Bangladesh. I guess the uh, WPL players have, I'd just be going straight there. Um, three ODIs, three T20s. The big the big part of this, and this is, I don't know, this 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 jumps out at me. This, this is bemusing, honestly. Um, and we saw signs of this during the South Africa series where, where Jess Jonathan was in the squad but was being left out of 11s and then didn't play the test match, which I thought was quite surprising. They, they went for Sophie Molyneux in the test match. And I thought, you know, my reading on it was, okay, well, Molyneux's been out for so long you know, the last few years, basically, since, since the, the T20 World Cup at the MCG in 2020. She's played very little. She had stress fractures. She had moon boot stuff. She had knee, um, all kinds of injuries so i i sort of understood okay well they, they're giving her a go because she's back and she's fit and, and and they want to bring her back into the fold but with her in this squad jess jonathan's been left out of the squad altogether like it's been a, what, a dozen years or something since jess jonathan hasn't been in an australian squad this this seems bizarre to me i mean you're you're talking about she's third all time for australia in t20 wickets fourth all-time in ODI wickets um, she's never not done a job with the ball and she's been a massively underutilized resource if you want to get corporate speak on it which I don't but I did I don't know why with the bat as well for Australia like she's you know she's she's a much better player with the bat than she's been given opportunity to be um, it, it it just seems weird to be to be getting rid of her I mean and yes it's not permanent but it's it seems like a changing of the guard thing. She's thirty one, Molyneux's thirty six of uh, twenty six, and so they're going. Okay, well, you're basically the same player, left arm spinner who can bat decently. Um, so we'll, you know, is this just uh, leaving you out for a little while, or is or is this well, we've we've got an option that we want to back for the future. I think this is them saying we think Molyneux is more likely to win us a World Cup, uh, and look, Molyneux just performed so well at the WPL. And that's not to say that Jonathan didn't. She played for the Delhi Capitals and 
took a bunch of wickets there, 15 at 16, and was part of that side that made it through to the final. Um, so, yeah, 31, it shouldn't be the end. But the, the, the challenge that Jonathan's got is that they prefer Molyneux and they've got King and Wareham at bowl leg breaks. And that's a slightly different category, I suppose. She's not really competing with them, I don't think. She's more competing with Molyneux. No. And they think Molyneux's upside's there. <laughs> And, and Gardner as well is the other finger spinner. Um, we shouldn't sure, ignore that. Sure, turning it the other way. A, a finger spinner. Turning it the other way, but they've got a finger spinner in in, um, in Gardner who is always going to play it right. She's going to be one of the first names on the team sheet every week. So it does become a bit of a shootout between Jonathan and Molyneux. Mm. And look, that's the nature of selection, right? At some point, you have to make a call on who you think's better. And they, they just think um, in that one spot in the side that Molyneux's better. And look, it's a it's a... I'm sure it's a 55-45 type of call. I don't think there's a right mm. or a wrong answer, but I'm sure it's broken down to that. She's just unlucky that in a specialised position, if there's one spot for a left-arm spinner, which there probably is on for the reasons I've already outlined with them liking having a leggy in the team and they've already got Gardner. And look, it, it might change between now and the World Cup because remembering they're playing this bilateral series in Bangladesh and that's where the World Cup is later this year. They've never played a bilateral series in Bangladesh. It might be they rock up there and they think they need four spinners in each game, not three. Um, it might be they need to really go all in on spin and or even five. They might say five spinners plus one seamer um, might be sufficient to give them the balance they want for a World Cup, in which case Jonathan might have a way back then. But, you know, this, this decision was made a few weeks ago when she responded by taking a forfa in the WNCL and, and taking a stack of wickets in the WPL. So she's going to keep fighting she's not going to give up her spot without a without a stoush and, and nor should she given her tremendous record that you referred to before so um yeah it'll be interesting to see how that plays out without her they start their one day series at dhaka uh, on thursday and then as i say it's the, the t20 world cup they're really there to prep for which i think that starts in late july if memory serves me correctly maybe early august no so no it's more september no, september anyway either way Either way, they're they're in they're in Bangladesh a lot this year, and they're not normally there. So, this will be an acclimatisation tour as much as anything else. Yeah, I, I just don't get that. I don't get how you can look at a player who's been out injured for most of the last few years and say that they're a better player than someone who's been in the side and been performing, and who's never not performed really. I mean, it, Sophie Molyneux is not a better cricketer than Jess Jonathan, and the their their records side by side speak to that. Um, it's it's a it's a bizarre call to me Molyneux is a very good player but I don't she's, know. I don't think she's never done anything to say she's better hasn't she I mean I don't know like I don't know if I, I think it's as clear cut as that what Jonathan does if you want to strip it back what Jonathan does is bowls extremely economically off a couple of paces and has that has that um that lower trajectory keeps batters mm. honest not a big turner of the ball keeps the stumps in play Molyneux has more exaggerated turn um, and Molyneux bats at a higher tempo, so I, I don't think it's I don't think they're the identical cricketer. It's just more mm. that they're subtly different from each other. And she's five years younger. They're doubtless yeah. thinking about the side into the future. And Molyneux, we were talking the other week that she, if she hadn't have been injured, she probably be um, probably would have been in the frame to be captain. They clearly like her leadership uh, credentials and. She did super well after returning to the Victorian side. And yeah, I mean, I know she's had the injury layoff and so on, but I don't think it's like a, a, a one player is better than the other. I think like mm. a lot of things in cricket selection, there's an argument both ways and that's why they get paid to make those calls and it isn't done based purely on on numbers alone. No. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think the age thing, my guess is that the age thing's playing into it in terms of starting to move on a few of the older generation of players but at 31, you know, yeah. Jonathan could be playing for six or seven more years, you know, she's not the older generation of players and the batting tempo stuff, we've seen what she can do in the Big Bash when she, when she's batted top order, um, she's she's a terrific striker um, she's just in that Australian team has so often been coming in at 9 or 10 and not had much to do with the bat um, because, because they're so stacked so yeah, it doesn't uh, w without having been walked through the reasoning, it doesn't look to me like a call that stacks up, but there we are. Um, England women knocked off New Zealand easily in the opening T20 at Dunedin, made 160 for four. Maya Bushio, 43, not out. Sophia Dunkley, mm. 32. Heather Knight, 63, quickly at number five. Um, yeah, I mean, Heather Knight's 33, and she's not considered an, an ancient player who needs to be moved on. She's she's um, still, well, uh, just about the most significant player in that team behind Nat Silverbrunt, I guess. Um, New Zealand 
didn't really get near it. 133 for five. Susie Bates made a half century at the top of the order, but they were never really um, in, in the frame to track that down. Yeah, I, I, I never really know who's captain of the New Zealand white ball teams. It's usually Bates or Devine, but Devine would have come back from the WPL like a lot of these um, uh, players in this in this series where they're missing the first couple of T20s due to those commitments in India. Interesting, the England are really backing in my Bouchier at four. I think that's, it. that's, that's a noteworthy structural move that she's going to get that crack there, I think, ahead of the World Cup. And she's a classy player, 43 not out, and, and Dunkley at the top of the list. And yeah, Heather Knight, what a... What a career she's putting together. She's been captain of that England team since June 2016. Um, Lottie's last series was the World Cup of uh, March 2016. So you don't often see international captains who've done the job for eight years. And I can't see any scenario really where she gives it up soon. She, the, 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 It's been a sight in her, um, in her image and a World Cup champion and what she would give to, to win another one later this year. So the fact that she's still making runs, more in that finishing role at number five, Knight's often batted in the top three in, in T20 cricket, but coming in down there at five and making uh, 63 in, in just 39 balls. So that's noteworthy there. And I, I kind of always feel like Bates must be nearing retirement, but top scoring again. And as I say, leading the mm. team at the moment. So it looks like she'll go through to at least that World Cup, 36 years of age now. And England with the ball, it was the squeeze from... The slower bowlers, Dean, none for 21 from four, so they went for nothing really. Glenn, one for 17 from four. She's often been on the edge of being selected or left out with, with her um, with her leg breaks. And uh, Bell, who has, um, has uh, in this particular series, gets uh, um, an opportunity to, to lead the attack, um, two for 29, remembering that they don't have uh, Mahika Gore and they don't don't have Lauren Filer, I think, although I could stand to be corrected, but they don't have everyone at their, their disposal right now. So Bell's getting that chance to take the new ball and made yeah. the most of it in that first game at Dunedin. They're playing uh, four more T20s in three one days. And of course, all the attention in women's cricket right now is that T20 World Cup later in the year. The, the last bit on women's cricket, the revamp of the English county system where they're going to have this, this small top tier of women's sides uh 16 of the 18 counties are have all pitched up to yeah. have one of the top tier sides now which is interesting so the the ones who haven't derbyshire and worcestershire are two of the counties that most often host um, england women's internationals and where we've been to those grounds an awful lot over the years watching women's cricket um they're the two who've said that we're not actually ready to do it yet um that that that, that we want more time to develop our system to be able to adequately support a top level women's team um and and don't have the resources to to put into it to go straight to the to the top but yeah 16 of the 18 are saying um give us a spot and there are only so many spots to go around yeah, it'll be a shit fight. Uh, it's really 16 of the 19 in a way because the MCC were invited, but they've they've um, joined up with Middlesex, which makes sense. Given well, that was always going to happen, Middlesex wasn't it? A, a tenant at Lords. Oh, I think there was an outside chance the MCC would go on their own. But anyway, it's a moot point now. Um, so the interviews uh, take place over the next month, I believe, and we'll hear decisions in April. I'm glad it's a competitive process. I said this last week in relation to to Kent and Northamptonshire. Disappointing that Derbyshire and Worcester didn't feel like they had the resources to do it. Derbyshire hosted all of the games in 2020 behind closed doors. That's where um, England are hosting internationals there. And, and Worcester, as you point out, Jeff, have been a great supporter of women's cricket as the county that have hosted so many great games there. I love going to New Road a couple of times a year for women's internationals. But um, they've said that, well, in Derbyshire's case, they don't have um, the, the money to make it sustainable. So they're going to try and become a tier two side, first of all, and then try and go up to tier one later. But what it does mean that a number of the sides that are up for tier one will end up in tier three because they're splitting it to three groups of six. So there'll be some very, mm. very disappointed applicants in that setup. Um, yeah. There's been lots of back and forth online about um, about what a club should have, what is suitable in the modern game. Like, should you be playing all of the games on the main sort of senior ground, um, what the outground situation might look like, how many test playing counties. We just assumed, right, when this was announced, I think we said it on the podcast, we're like, well, it'll just be the, the test playing nation, or the be test the playing six. ground, sorry, that'll get all of the spoils. But but maybe not, maybe not. So, um, yeah, work to do there for the, uh, the ECB, who are tipping in 1.3 million quid per annum uh, for, the, uh, for the teams in the top tier. So... That'll be, you know, a decent incentive for those who do get themselves over the line, and and we'll um, 
we'll try and keep tabs on the process as the as they um, release the findings in, in the weeks to come. <coughs> The Mr. Sheffield Shield, uh, when we were speaking about this last week, Tasmania were six points clear of second and looking to host a final. Well, they're in a final. Um, they're all, they're in a final in the basketball. They've got a, an Aussie rules team and they're in the final for the Shield, but they're not hosting it. Um, they got beaten badly by South Australia at home as well at Bell Reeve, um, capitulated really. All out for 123 and 189. Big game for the Nathan Mooks. Nathan McAndrew, six wickets in the first innings. Nathan McSweeney made 117 in a low-scoring game. Jordan Buckingham took five for as well in the other innings. Um, so, you know, comprehensive win for South Australia. Nathan McAndrew, 48 wickets at 19, um, second on the Sheffield mm. Shield tally through the season, which stands out as well. Um, so, yeah, South Australia got three wins in the season, but they, they took Tassie's chance to host the final off them, which means they have to go to Perth instead. It's it's a pretty significant um, blowing of an opportunity there, although they're very bullish. They're upbeat. Bo Webster is probably the most upbeat um, person in Australian cricket at the moment, talking up a big game. Matthew Wade, similarly, they're, they're, you know, talking about going over there and um, just just giving it a red hot crack, um, which you know I, I hope they are able to keep that attitude up because playing playing WA in Perth is a tough job. I used to always say that going from Brisbane to Perth was the longest trip in football. It's probably now um, Tasmania to Perth, I'd imagine. Mm. Well, I've got my um, Tasmanian um, themed jumper on today. I thought that was relevant to the podcast. Oh yeah, um, we're, uh, we're on yeah, brand. The, given what we were talking about earlier and, and knowing that that the, the the Tigers are in the final. Yeah, you're right. You should bottom. sign up. There's sign, no two sign, ways up about it. A, sign up as a, a founding. I, I signed up. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a founding member. I'm definitely yeah, signing get up. Get in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think all footy people should sign up. It just demonstrates that there is this support for a Tasmanian club and it's not made up. It's not, you know, we will go to games. I will sign up as a founding member and I will occasionally watch Tasmania play games of football. It'll be lovely. Mm -hmm. um, weekend away. There's no better place, really. If, you, if you're a member of Tasmanian tourism and you want to, Line, align with the final word. Get in touch. Um, no, the um, <laughs> we're doing it for the Bell Reeve. Yeah, the Bell Reeve. Um, you know, home game against South Australia was the perfect draw for them. And yeah, they've thrown away their chance to be at home, going to the Wacker, playing against WA, and we'll come to them in a sec. Spoiler alert: they beat Victoria. Um, and and you know they're trying to win their third title in a row. They know what it takes to win finals. We know that they've had so much success at. Um, 50 over and 20 over level as well. So, um, yeah, and, and you, you mentioned Matthew Wade. Next, well, this week's Sheffield Shield final, it starts on Thursday, will be his final game of first-class cricket. He's decided to prioritise the Shield final over the start of the IPL. Good on him for doing that. Um, Matthew Wade played 36 test matches across three stretches um, beginning in 2012. He made four centuries and averaged 30 at test level. Most of those test matches were his wicketkeeper. But, you know, got back into the side um, as a specialist bat with Tasmania, a lot of those 19 first-class tons he made were, were in that two-year purple patch. He was dropped from the Aussie side as keeper. He went back to Tasmania and made a shed load of runs and, um, you know, has had a lot of success for both the Tassie side and the Victorians in the shield. He's won four of them. I think he led Victoria to to two titles. It might have been back-to-back, -back actually, when he was skippering uh, the Victorian team in the mid-2010s. But, um, yeah, he was, I guess, collateral damage from a test perspective after India beat Australia in, in 2020-21, a series where he was opening the batting for a time and was back in the middle order, but has the chance to um, end his career on a, on a high note this week at the Wacker at age 36 and still in the T20 stuff, Jeff. He was leading the T20 side in New Zealand as recently as a few weeks ago. So the extent mm. to which how he goes in this game and how he goes in the IPL might influence whether he gets one final fling as an Australian player in the Caribbean in a couple of months' time. Yeah, I think that's a good good chance that he does. They they like his 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 ball one ability, you know, to to go out there and strike cleanly, particularly late in an innings. He's someone he he kind of won me over. I was I, I didn't necessarily love the way Matthew Wade um, uh, played in that era when they were trying to be super aggressive all the time it felt kind of mm. forced but the 2019 incarnation when he was just happy to get to stand at the crease and get battered by Joffrey Archer was uh, it, it was hard not to love there was there was something um, quite endearing about 
about his willingness to, to get hurt and to take it in good humour and, and to, to sort of treat it as though he was still enjoying himself out there. Um, New South Wales beat Queensland easily. That game didn't have anything riding on it, so it didn't matter a whole lot. Um, the notable thing being that Ollie Davies for New South Wales made another 100, uh, number six. That was after Queensland yeah. got bowled out cheaply on day one. Chris Tremaine took six for um, New South Wales, chased a small target five down uh, Tremaine 50 wickets at 16 um yeah big big season 33 years old but um doesn't it hasn't hadn't hasn't had his run basically due to the uh, uh the triumvirate of fast bowlers in the test team and then Victoria uh, lost to WA which meant that they are out of the running um you know, we were talking about that last week. 138 runs to the margin in the end. They got shot out, kind of like Tassie, got smashed up at home, bowled out cheaply, 144 and 130. Um, Cameron Gannon took five wickets in the first innings there. Victoria sort of had a sniff when Boland took four wickets and, and bowled out WA for 169. But, um, you know, in the end, it, it wasn't particularly close. Um, you know, Will Sutherland emotional after that game and, and they've blown their chance. Yeah, just to go back to the Queensland New South Wales stuff for a second here, and Tremaine specifically. I know we've had a few footy references today, but uh, and Hawthorne specifically, so we'll stay there. there. There's this WhatsApp group of players. It's called the 9108 group, I think. So every Hawthorne player who didn't feature in a premiership in that drought between 91 and 2008 are in a WhatsApp group together. There should be a similar WhatsApp group for all the Australian fast bowlers who have been denied uh, sustained test representation due to the big three. And Tremaine would be right in the middle of that. He's taken 351 first-class wickets at 22. Um, and you say he's 33, but um, his, his performance this year, the only shield bowler to take 50 wickets at 16, including, yeah, six for 20 in this final game. To get New South Wales in the third spot, by the way, I mean, they've overtaken Victoria. They didn't win a game last year. They lost the first two this year. They've won four um, and come home with a wet sail winning their last couple. So good on them. And as for Ollie Davies, uh, he I mentioned last week that it seems a bit silly to be talking up someone with like three first class hundreds, but he's making them at the right time of year. When you make first class hundreds in February and March, um, that leaves your name on the, the tip of the tongue of selectors when you head into the winter. So the fact mm. that he's got youth on his side as well, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Davies getting blooded through a you know an Australia A squad or a you know a, a CA eleven or, or something like that in the coming months because. I know he's done it all at number six, but um, still, you've got to make those runs. And yeah, Victoria, that they, they're devastated. Will Sutherland um, did a press uh, engagement with Adam White as soon as the game was over when they were chasing uh, quite a lot. They were bowled out for 169. Um, but they got back into the game. Like they, that, Sorry, they, they, they bowled out WA for 169 in the second dig and gave themselves a, a, a chaseable target of 269, something like that. Kellaway makes a half century and, you know, you kind of, they were believing they could do this, right? At home, at the Junction Oval. They'd made that Shield final the last couple of years. But yeah, Sutherland was um, broken down in tears talking to Whitey um, about how devastated that he was. And I loved, I love that. I love that. I love the fact that Sheffield Shield cricket isn't just a platform to play for Australia. It hurts mm. these guys when it doesn't work out. It means a tremendous amount. And, um, you know, Chris Rogers was on radio with uh, on SEN last week talking about this and, saying, and giving the wider perspective about a young team that's making its way. They're a little bit ahead probably of where they thought they'd be having lost their first two games of the season. They lost to WA in Brisbane in the first fortnight and looked nowhere near it, albeit away from home and have done well to get where they have. But they ultimately end up in, in fourth spot here because they were overtaken by New South Wales and, and WA got to 47 points level with um, Tasmania, but they had the superior net run rate, which is the tiebreaker in the shield, which means that yeah, WA, who are hosting it this week at the Wacker, uh, they won't have uh, Cameron Green or Mitchell Marsh. I don't know if you saw that story, Jeff, but there was some chat that they might try and bring one or both in for the, uh, the shield final before releasing them to the IPL, but um, that's not going to happen. Um, they will have Aaron Hardy with them in the Shield final, but Aaron Hardy has overnight been pulled out of his Surrey stint between May and July. It's quite a long stint. I think from memory, he was playing four first-class games and the entirety of the, the Blast qualification stage, so whatever that works out to be, 14 T20 games, I think it is. Um, but um, they've said that CA are managing his workload, so that is cold comfort for him, I guess, knowing that um, they they see him as a valuable enough asset to manage and, and thus not have him going to England where he had a brief stint 
brief stint with Surrey a, a couple of summers ago. In other news of that variety, Will Pekofsky has been unsurprisingly um, pulled out of his Leicestershire stint. He was going to go there for the first five games of the season, but recovering from that serious concussion a couple of weeks ago, he won't be there. Marcus Harris will replace him. Marcus Harris going back to the club uh, at Grace Road, where he made all those runs in 2021 before a couple of years at, at Gloucestershire. So he'll play five rounds along with his Victorian uh, teammate, Peter Hanscom, who's playing the whole season there at Leicester. Um, and also Will Sutherland's been pulled out. So I mentioned he was in, in tears after the game. He's also picked up a, another round of back issues, which was what kept him away when he was meant to play at Essex last year. And it's Somerset this time that won't uh, be able to uh, utilise the Victorian captain. So he was going to play for three months at the start of the season. Not to be, it feels precautionary. It doesn't feel like a serious injury. We'd probably know more about it if it was serious. But still, that does mean that um, both or all of Hardy, Sutherland and Bukowski have all, all pulled out of England commitments in the last few games in and around this, this final stretch of Shield cricket. Yeah, and frustrating given just how much that can contribute to the development of a player, and there there have been yeah. these issues with um, you know with Australian players. The, the, the years when Australian players did go to England a lot um, and, and and figure out how to manage playing there, um, and and just just getting used to the place compared to the ones who haven't had that opportunity, and how much less frequent that is. IPL about to start, like you mentioned earlier in the show, we'll keep half an eye on that over the next few weeks, more more than a few weeks, a couple of months, um, as it keeps extending to be. That means the Ranji season is done. Mumbai won the title for the 42nd time, just the 42 in the trophy cabinet for Mumbai. Um, and Afghanistan and Ireland played their T20 and, and ODI series. Afghanistan won the ODIs 2-0. Um, and then won the deciding T20 as well, bowling out Ireland fairly cheaply. Um, Ibrahim Zadran, 72, not out of 51 balls, someone we've been keeping an eye on. And Asmatullah, there always had to be an Asmatullah entry. Four for nine from his four overs with the ball to uh, win the game and win the series in the T20s between Afghanistan and Ireland. And then Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, you promised we'd get back to this the real grudge match the uh the the spiciest contest in world cricket uh what what caught your eye as as they moved through their long long engagement yeah just around at the show not much of interest truth be told uh, bangladesh won the one day is 2-1 after sri lanka got over the line in the t20s 2-1 three pretty close one day as they had scorecards that remin reminiscent of a, a different era really with them um, sort of 250 being sufficient to win the game or thereabouts tons to Shantu and the Sanka and to Janeth Liangi who's the youngish now Sri Lankan all-rounder who's had a good run of late um, if more interest will be the two test matches which start uh, this week and uh, Hasaranga is back which is the, the storyline which I wasn't anticipating he retired from test cricket last year at 26 to focus on white ball stuff and He's in that Sri Lankan squad of 17, which means that he is going to be missing some IPL to play test cricket. So we mentioned Matthew Wade will be doing that for Tasmania. I definitely didn't think the Hasaranga, having made all that money no. out of the Sunrisers in that mega auction a couple of years ago, I think it was the mega auction, anyway, that he would be uh, missing at least three uh, games for Sunrisers Hyderabad if these test matches go the distance. The first begins on Friday. So we'll be keeping more of a, a close eye on that. I did wonder the sort of the extent to which it might be the rivalry that brought him back mm. or, or maybe just where Sri Lanka are at in the World Test Championship. They've, they've only played two matches and you compare that to England and Australia that have played like 10 or 11 by this stage. So they've lost their two matches to Pakistan, but they might see an opportunity. If they get on a roll here, if they beat Bangladesh and if they go on to do well against England in the home summer over here, then they've got New Zealand, South Africa. Neither of those teams are strong at the moment. Then Australia at home to finish. They could see it as, look, 60% on points might be enough to get you through to the World Test Championship final. And, hmm. and thus, they need to give themselves every opportunity. And Hasaranga might have sort of read the tea leaves on, on that front as well. But either way, great to see him back playing um, in test cricket in a, a series that will generate a lot of interest due to that rivalry you referred to before. I wonder I wonder I wonder if there's some sort of political involvement of somebody got in his ear about it um, and suggested that he he needed to to get back and get involved. Yeah, it's a curious one, the re retirement and unretirement in your mid 20s for test cricket, but hey, if Hasaranga's back, um that that's that's all for the better, um, and if he's willing to miss a little bit of IPL, then that's encouraging as well. Um, take take the the small wins where you get them, I suppose. 
I think that's enough for us. Uh, if you want to support the show, patron.com slash the final word is the place to get involved. You can send us a nerd pledge there, play the game, uh, meet up with the other nice people on the internet. Um, thanks to uh, all of the people who back the show and do it that way. Uh, NordVPN, you can get your discount deal there using the link in the show notes. And... Um, I think that's it. We've got, what have we got coming up later in the week? There might be a little uh, extra ep at some point, maybe on the Friday we'll record a story time for the weekends um, as, as we as we settle into a, a bit of time at home. Yep, sounds about right. Definitely story time, probably something else, and uh, and that'll be the rhythm of the next few weeks where we try and, um, try and just take things back one notch or two uh, over the next couple of busy IPL months. All right, that's it. Episode 30 of Season 15. Catch you later. Bye.